Hi. How you doing? It's been a while. So I think, crap, what's it been, a full month at least since I've done a video? Yeah, it's been, it's been a long time. Okay, well, I've been kind of busy the last few weeks, so tonight, finally, I got a free time. I said, you know what, I haven't seen a movie in a while, so rather than just stay home and just rest, I said, I'll go see a movie. Yeah, whatever, get a video up on YouTube. I haven't seen you guys in a while. And I'd like to... <laughs> It's going to sound so stupid, but I'd like to congratulate myself, and and I'd like to thank you guys for um, my channel now getting its close. It's within about 10 uh, video views of 300 views, uh, which is kind of cool. And my five subscribers, thank you, and uh, thanks for watching the videos. Okay, tonight, uh, I just kind of on a whim saw a movie, and the last time I saw a movie on a whim, if you've seen my other channel, which doesn't exist anymore, of course, I saw, what was it, um, it was a really bad Justin Timberlake movie, oh yeah, uh, In Time, yeah, it had Amanda Seyfried, Seyfried, whatever her name is, um, and that movie was bad, and then I went into this movie, uh, this movie I saw tonight, you can see in the description above, it's called The Call. And, uh, you know, I'd heard about it, I heard it was something of a, you know, unexpected hit, uh, or at least a little bit of a hit, bigger hit than they were expecting, uh, which is kind of nice. You know, it, it's nice when that happens in Hollywood, you produce a film for, I, I, I uh, looked up a little bit of information on the film, it only cost like $13 million to make, and they made more than that in their first weekend. That That's always wonderful when that happens. That means people go out, they see it, evidently they like it, the word of mouth is good enough. Because it's actually kind of held kind of well over this... It, it came out about mid-March, um, actually a week after uh, Wizard of Oz, but... Anyway, since then, the only thing that's come out since then that kind of interested me was G.I. Joe, and I just haven't gotten around to seeing it. And if I do see it, it'll it'll be soon. Very, very soon. But yeah, The Call. Uh, Halle Berry is the star here. You know her, of course, for her Oscar-winning uh, performances and her... Well, I shouldn't say performances. She's only got one Oscar, but... Um, and, uh, yeah, she was pretty good in this. I'm going to say, yeah, The Call was, it's good. I wouldn't call it great, but for a Friday night entertainment, you could do a whole lot worse. <laughs> I'll say that. Uh, Halle Berry is a star here, and she plays a 911 operator who one day, you know, in her monotonous life of, you know, pick up the phone, yeah, 911, yeah, we're getting somebody to the location. Thank you very much for calling, you know, blah, blah, blah. We'll get a squadron over there or whatever. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. You see it all the time on television and stuff. And actually, yeah, I looked up a little information on this. This was supposed to be a TV series. But then they said, no, let's make let's let's make it a movie. That's kind of cool, uh, <laughs> the way it, it kind of happened like that. But uh, anyways, uh, this movie does interest me a little bit. I mean, it it kind of caught my attention in the first, you know, 20, 25 minutes or so. Because that was about the best, the lead, lead up to it, the premise of it. It's something that's kind of cool, because on TV, when we see a 911 operator, and usually in movies too, we see him for like 30 seconds, and then that that's over. Then we cut to a car, police car coming in, sirens blaring. We see it a million times. I mean, seriously, Anymore, it's like we don't even notice it. And now this movie comes up and says, now let's just, let's like hardly ever show the cop cars coming. Let's just show the 911 operators. That's kind of, that's interesting. I like that. And then there was also a little speech about, yeah, about 15, 20 minutes in when Holly Berry was uh, talking to newbies about, uh, about uh, the days of the week for 911 operators, how, yeah, they said Friday nights, like a living hell or something like that. I can't remember what the line was, but it was something like that. And they said, and Saturday mornings usually start slow because everybody's hung over, everybody's still asleep, you know. It's the weekend, you know, not much happens. And then they said by, you know, in the afternoon, then things pick up and so on. And yeah, and they live in LA, so yeah, naturally it's a pretty busy town. Okay, anyway, the plot of the movie revolves around her character getting a 911 call from somebody who says, a burglar has broken into my house. She's a young girl, about 15, 16 years old or so, and uh, a blonde, which comes, uh, not to spoil anything, but that's a little important in the plot. But, um, and, uh, you know, she you know, tells her what to do and, and everything, and it looks like the, the call, you know, the, the uh, burglar is going to, you know, just leave and get away, but then something happens, and the the burglar 
takes a girl, kidnaps her, and I think you've seen it in all the promos, yeah, she gets killed. And they find her body, and then Holly Berry's kind of upset by this. I think it's, she said in the movie, yeah, it might be probably since it affected her so dramatically, the first time that she's ever, you know, gotten a call and kind of, you know, had to be with a person. You know, 911 operators usually, you know, especially in, you see them in TV shows and movies, they're on the line 20 seconds, they don't care, they're on to the next, the next caller. You know, it's kind of like a, you know, whatever. But anyways. But, um... <clears throat> then, uh, you know, she's a little bit more upset by that. So she kind of quits her job there, or gets, you know, forcibly demotes herself to a teacher. Kind of like the trainer. Uh, and then something else happens. Some other girl is kidnapped, and later on we find out, and you see it in all the previews, yet again, the same guy has out and kidnapped another girl, another blonde girl, about 15, 16, you know, 17 years old, in that general age. And uh, Abigail Breslin, by the way, who I've, I've seen her, I, I first saw her actually in, and saw that she was a great actress in a movie, you might have heard it, called Little Miss Sunshine. Yeah, it came out a few years ago, but she was really good in that. And I remember she has an older brother who uh, used to be in, like, I don't know, dumb movies I watched as a kid, like The Cat in the Hat, stuff like that. God, why was I watching that? I'm so stupid. Uh, and it's affected kids' brainwaves on that. Ah, whatever. I hate that movie. But uh, with a firing passion, and Mike Myers can never be forgiven for that. But anyways, the fact of the matter is, uh, these two ladies, Halle Berry and Abigail Breslin, they're kind of a neat pair up because you don't, yeah, you wouldn't really think of that, you know, except for like a mother-daughter relationship, but this isn't that. And it's, their relationship is kind of interesting in just the way, you know, the 911 operator, you know, literally right before, this is kind of a complaint too, but it kind of comes off as a neat effect later on. She says to the newbies, literally right before she gets into the action, never make a phone call personal. And what does she do? She goes in, picks up the phone or whatever, you know, attaches on the line and says, you know, and says all this stuff, and pretty soon she's talking about, you know, what's your favorite movie or, uh, you know, you know, and she makes her all these promises, <laughs> and just literally, you know, sentences ago in her dialogue, she was saying, never make a promise, and it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a thing where they could have thought that out a little bit more, but then again, I guess it's poetic justice or something, the way that it's the same kidnapper and stuff, but anyways, and then this, that's pretty much the first acting movie, it's kind of a shorter movie, it's only about an hour and a half or so. But it, it kind of moves along at a really nice pace before we get to the, the very problematic third act that uh, everybody talks about, uh, who's seen the movie at least, especially critics, but I'm not totally a critic. I don't have a newspaper or anything like that, or a blog even, so I can't call myself an official critic. But, but anyways, um, the second act is the girls kidnapped, and most of it, I'd say almost all of it, you, where you separate the acts, the or the uh, segments in a way, are, you know, obviously you could t do it by time, half an hour, half an hour, half an hour, or you could do it by, um, you know, what's happening with the girl, you know, ends, she, you know, she's kidnapped, end of the first act. She, you know, is, you know, knocked out in the trunk, end of the second act. Movie ends, obviously the end of the third act. And, yeah, so the second act, she's been kidnapped, she's in the trunk of the car, and, uh, you know, Holly Berry keeps telling her stuff to do so they can pinpoint it, because, coincidentally, uh, she has her friend's left-behind phone, which is a track phone, doesn't have a GPS thing in it, and you can totally tell this movie was filmed and meant to be distributed about, about six, seven months ago, at least. <laughs> at least. Um, because, you know, track phones... It's 2013, April 2013. Track phones are not very popular anymore. And the, kind of the excuse why the girl had it was kind of lame and not very well thought out, and they could have taken more time to develop the script. But then again, they started filming this. I, if I heard right from a report, they started to film this actually part of it in like January of last year, 2012. So I thought, gosh, this movie... That, uh, hmm. I don't know why they couldn't pick up this movie. It's actually, it actually is a really good movie. Uh, in fact, you know, it, it, when you think of terms of spring movies, but uh, but yeah, we're coming into the you know season of April, and it's late April now, going to be pretty soon, which means we get stink bomb films that that you know production companies and big uh, distributing companies 
they think it's a great idea and pre in and, and they green light it you know they film it you know they say oh everything's going great you know and then they they screen it and they're just like oh crap you know there's 30 40 million dollars out the window we're not going to get that back yeah so uh now you get movies like pain and gain which looks dreadfully awful and you get movies like the big wedding which looks even worse that are coming out on the same weekend before we get to the big summer blockbusters but then you'll probably see me this will be like my you know second home now uh once we get into that because right away in may there's like at least a good four movies that i have to see opening day or else it's not going to be good <laughs> but uh yeah there's at least four and then there's two more that's that come out in wide release one of them i'm on the fence about the other one i you know not really for me not really in my age group but it's got a, a nice all-star cast in the voice department. But yeah, point is, uh, we're here to talk about the call, so let's get back to the call. Like, who's calling me now? Yeah, and I said, yeah, okay. I'm stupid. And five-star rating, thank you very much. So, uh, the second act of this movie really actually is good. Like, it actually, the suspense sort of builds and builds and builds to the point where we don't, you know, we're almost to the 45-minute point at one, at one point, and Abigail uh, has been kind of hurt. Wow, what was her character name? Uh, yeah, which, another thing, I can't really, uh, I think it was like K Casey, that's it. I'm trying to, I, I thought the Holly Berry's character was named Casey, and I was like, Jordan? That's not right, because I know Jordan is the name of the Holly Berry character, and the, yeah. Anyway, so Casey, she's been in the half, in the trunk for almost half an hour, in the, I think, like, it's almost like real time, it seems, kind of from the way everything's happening. And the guy hasn't noticed her, she's screaming at points, she's very, you know, of course she would be screaming, crying, very emotional, and the guy doesn't notice. Or if he notices, he just doesn't care, because he knows he's going to do something to her, and, and you know, it's all going to go well for him, not so great for her, so let her scream, let her cry, let her weep, you know, let her emotions just make colors with the wind. No, that was not supposed to be a Pocahontas reference. Okay, so, and then, you know, when he does realize she's doing stuff, and you see it in a few previews, you know, she knocks out taillights and stuff like that, then, yeah, when that suspense builds, you don't know, okay, is he going to kill her right away, is he going to save her for later, you know, and so on. And if you, of course, you see the previews, then it's ruined because you know something's going to happen. You can't have the movie just end like that. And by the way, uh, no, 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 I'll get to that later. But anyways, and then, you know, the second act ends, you know, somebody else gets involved and they, you know, you know, it's, you know, it becomes a little, it's more than just him and her and the telephone operator. And so by the third act, that's when things start to get a little, uh, you know, you had a good movie, like a 7 or an 8 out of 10, you know, I could have been fair, you know, really, really easy to this film and gave it an 8 out of 10 if the third act had held up well. But since the third act did not, that's when it drops. That's when it, yeah, that's when I'm starting to be on the fence of recon recommending this movie or not. But I think if you go out with this in mind as being nothing more than just a suspenseful thrill ride, you'll have, you know, and bring your popcorn and bring your Skittles or your uh, Tootsie Rolls, whatever you eat, candy, and sit down, you'll have a good time. Also, I think it's a good movie for uh, for uh, DVD rental audiences, Redbox. I can imagine this being a very popular Redbox movie. I can imagine a lot of teenage girls will kind of dare themselves to go see this movie because I've heard uh, girls talk about this movie and saying that there are some girls who actually do not want to go near this movie because what's the plot about? A teenage girl gets kidnapped. What teenage girl would want to go see that and look at it as sport? You know, what, I, I know a few very, very uh, scary men go and see it as sport. I do not. I just, I was like, I saw it on a whim. I don't know. But uh, I can see this as kind of being a truth or dare, like, this would be the dare. Watch the most intense scenes in this film that involve the girl and the kidnapper, and, you know, don't scream, don't look away from the screen, you know, stuff like that. You know, and, uh, and I can imagine, yeah, I can imagine this being a really big hit on DVD and kind of getting a little bit of a cult following. Not a huge cult following. This isn't the new The Thing from John Carpenter, and it's not, you know, uh, I don't know, what do you kids watch these days? Pulp Fiction on DVD or VHS tape? Which sounds like a good time, believe me or not. Quentin Tarantino, 
I love Quentin Tarantino, and anything for that I would be down for, actually. Just don't make it too much of a habit. You gotta... <laughs> there's not just Quentin Tarantino out there. Anyway, so this third act, then we, Halle Berry, as you see in the previews, gets into the action, leaves the hive, as they call it, which was another working title, actually, for the film. And the call is kind of, it's one of those basic titles. It could mean anything. And the hive could also mean anything. And the hive actually makes it sound like more of a Silence of the Lambs-esque thriller. You know, you know what, what is there going to be, instead of the Silence of the Lambs, the Silence of the Hornets, the Silence of the Bees, something like that? Uh, I don't know. As long as we don't get too much into the birds and the bees, that's all I care about. But I really think The Hive sounds like a good title, but it just wouldn't have... The, the thing wouldn't have worked. It would have been a, oh, I get it, that's the, you know, the first act of the movie already brings in the title. What's the rest of the movie about? <sighs> Not The Hive. Uh, but yeah, um, then, you know, the girl gets taken to a place. We know it's dark and scary, and the guy has a lot of bad stuff planned for her. And we know that it's going to be scary, we know it's going to be freaky, we know it's, yeah. The problem with that is, that's when the predictability kicks in. You know, the second act mostly is a little different. It's not by the numbers, which is nice. The third act, it's, what happened? It's like the screenwriters just, their balls dropped off, to quote the Joker. They gave up on this originality. They said... We're doing a thriller here. We gotta end it thriller-wise, except for the very end, which was not the way to do it. The way they ended it, I don't want to discuss. Because number one, yeah, if you want to see this movie on a whim or as a good time, go ahead. I won't give you the ending because you probably won't be able to predict it from the way that things happen. But uh, you know, I swear I've got to talk about it sometime because there are so many drastic points I can make about this that weaken the film big time, almost to the point where if it had ended any worse, I probably would have downgraded it a whole point, at least, uh, because it was just so non-ending, not very good, flat ending, should have been rewritten from day one endings. It's uh, just like the ending of, say, A Nightmare on Elm Street, the remake. Dreadful. Awful. You know, maybe not, this isn't quite that bad, but it's you kind of Friday the 13th remake, too. All these horror movie remakes. They end on such a flat, degrading, you know, audience gimmicking note. This one isn't quite gimmicky, but it's just not well written and not very well thought out and not very reflective of what these characters really, you know, are. You know, it's not... Uh, I don't know. But anyways, and then it, the plot points kicking, you know, it's like... A to B, B to C, C to D, bada boom, bada boom, bada boom. It just keeps in that predictable pattern. We know, oh, there's going to be something scary now. Oh, here's something grisly. Oh, right there. Yeah. It's, uh, that's when I really started to say, this film's starting to, you know, this film's really starting to lose it now. And then it ended flat, and I was just like, that whole last third act is bullcrap compared to the first two. The first two are strong uh, stories that could, you know, as a television series, that would have made for a good series. And they still could make it a good series if this makes a little bit more money, but I don't think it is. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of other new releases coming out and people want to go see that. They pe Evil Dead scared out a few audience members for this. Yeah. I really think that uh, the third act is troublesome. Very troublesome to the point where what was once an 8 out of 10 now drops down to a 6 out of 10, which doesn't really sound that bad, but for a movie that was kind of, you know, like this, just a drop like that at the end, that is not good. But anyways, yeah. So I think that's about all I have to say. Uh, Barry and Breslin give in good performances. Not great performances, but the script doesn't really have any really genuine moments, you know, where they can step out of the shadow of, uh, of this, you know, the, the standardness of their characters. Except Halle Berry's character, I think she's kind of shallow, and they make her out to be, because we don't want a whole, you know, another half hour of her backstory. You know, we hear about this uh, guy in the beginning who calls her twice, you know, because he wants out of jail or whatever. He's never mentioned again. He's never, he never calls again. We never hear from him again. From him again. Where did he go? 
this guy, maybe her father, uncle, brother, we don't know who he is. That goes nowhere. I mean, talk about plot points that just vanish or, you know, or unfinished questions and so on. It's like, hey, I walked down the... Yeah, it's, it's stupid stuff like that. I hate when movies, they start, you know, and then the uh, the Breslin character, you know, she kind of has a few moments in the di in the script dialogue where she kind of, you know, has to pull the, the string or whatever. Not literally, but she has to do something, you know. And then when she does it, it you know, it can kind of be, you know, the satisfying crowd rioting thing that, you know, I, you know, I was like, well, of course she's going to do it. She's locked in a trunk, you know. There's certain stuff she has to do, and there's certain, and then there's a certain kind of emotional speech where you know she wants to talk to her family, or she wants to leave a note for her family, and I don't know, it was kind of well delivered, you know, you know, and for an actress her age or younger, it's really easy to do that and make it look like you know you mean it. Whereas with older people, you kind of have to get into it more, you know, like uh, you know. You know, Abigail Breslin and Halle Berry in this movie are no Daniel Day-Lewis and Lincoln, I can say that, but that was an Oscar-winning performance, so I can't really... It's kind of incomparable, but anyways. So, with that, I think I'll finish up and sign off here. I don't, I'm not wearing a hat today. That's one of the first times that hasn't happened in a little while. So, yes, keep watching my reviews. I'm watching you guys, hopefully, and uh, you guys hopefully watching me and hoping to get up to 300. Now, as far as what's coming, I would love to do uh, something happened last week, actually a week from yesterday, that I was immediately just said, I have to do a video on this. And you might have heard of it. I have not really conveyed it in any videos, but but uh, Siskel and Ebert, I love Siskel and Ebert. Watching back videos from the 60s, not 60s, 70s, 80s, I love that stuff. Watching movies, you know, that they, you know, the, watching them review movies that I, you know, saw when I was like two or three, and you know, of course, I liked every movie back then because, you know, except for the freaking scary movies that I saw, like Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and the movie and stuff like that. That was freaky. That's another video, but, but uh, Roger Ebert, as many of you know, or many of us know, you know, whether reading the headlines or if you are you know, connected at all to the movie or critiquing, uh, critiquing world, uh, know that he passed away last Thursday, and I would have loved to do a, like, a tribute, a, you know, life story of him, uh, but I just couldn't, when I would, I would try to kind of write out a little bit, you know, in my mind at least, just write out, okay, you know, kind of think it through. I never, I could never come up with the perfect thing, but, uh, I don't know, I got like, I could tell like the last two lines and I could get it to the point where I was, when I was reading it, was starting to almost get emotional with myself just from what I've written, which doesn't happen very often with me. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll write something and it's funny and I'll laugh at it, but never have I written something and just been immediately like welled up by it like that because it was kind of, it was kind of cool, but you've probably, in all the tribute videos out there on YouTube, you've probably seen some stuff that's similar to what I wrote, but... I haven't put it out there, by the way, so nobody ripped me off or anything. But, but uh, I would love to do something like that. I might get around to doing it. It's a little late, you know, more than a week after he's passed. Most of us have forgotten about it if you just read it on like Amazon or Amazon, MSN or Google or something. But, but yeah, um, definitely uh, R.I.P. Roger. You were with us a great many years. You fought hard with your. Um, with your uh, salivary cancer, or what was it? No, it wasn't salivary cancer. It was it was the salivary glands that got uh, cancerous, but uh, and it had to be you know, yeah, I can't think of what it was. But uh, and he, it looked like you know he was gonna go part time for a while at the Sun Times, and then he he was gone, and it's kind of a that was kind of a kind of kind of put a a thing you know in my week. It was kind of a Oh, that sucks, kind of thing, and it kind of dented my week a little bit. Didn't make Friday a very happy day because I have a good friend of mine who likes to. Uh, he, he loves Siskel and Ebert, and he actually looks something like Ebert. I don't want to make that a joke or a uh, you know, da, you know, degrade to him or anything. But he, uh, if you just fix up the hair a little bit, he's Roger Ebert. Um, 
Yeah, he was really, really taken aback by that because he read it. I think he said he read it just before he went to bed that night because he was just on his computer or whatever. And and he said he was he was kind of upset by it. I was very upset by it. And I was I was shocked for one, upset for another. But yeah. So yeah, I'm really, really, um, uh, you know, it's upsetting and it's too, you know, it's a shame. He lived seventy long years of his life. And I'm sure not a day goes by, you know, in his life where he was not black, where he was not happy with his job. Because you hear, you hear Gene Siskel joke on, like, David Letterman and stuff. You know, I saw a movie and it was so bad it made me think, well, maybe I'll just quit. You know, I love stuff like that. It makes for a good joke. But uh, Roger Ebert always took his job seriously. He always said... There's always going to be better movies. You know, if he was stuck in a you know, in a jam or whatever, where he was seeing like two, three bad movies a week, then you know, he always said, "Well, there's Martin Scorsese. He'll always do something." And I remember he wrote when he was talking about uh, the Oscars this past year. He was talking about Robert De Niro's nomination. He said, "He said Robert De Niro and I have kind of been on a lifelong journey together. You know, he said we were born about the same time and." He went into acting close to the same time I went into movie reviewing, you know, ser you know and was, you know, starting to do it, you know, as a very noticeable uh, critic. Right before, I think it was right before he won his Pulitzer Prize that Godfather Part Two came out, and that's when phew, he took off. But, but I remember that the night before, and this was totally out of the out of the blue, I just said, why don't I just watch some of Siskel and Ebert? And I watched them when they were on Letterman, and... If you see any of those videos when they're on David Letterman's show, they get to be really funny. After a while, they insult each other. They, you know, they they goof around with Dave and they and they shoot the crap for a while and just argue with each other to waste screen time. And they talk about blockbusters and sometimes a little more depth than they get in their re television reviews or even sometimes their newspaper reviews. But uh, and I remember I was just watching it and I said, "Thank God we still have Roger." I didn't say it or else I probably would have just, like, never spoken again. But uh, but I kind of thought, you know, I'm glad Roger is still doing what he's doing, because, you know, he can still, if he wanted to, right now, and of course that being that Wednesday before he passed away, he could go on David Letterman right now if he wanted to, and he could be awesome. You know, he could, he could rock the crowd. You know, he could make good jokes still. You know, Chaz, his wife, could be with him. And, you know, just to be there, support him, talk for him maybe sometimes when the thing wouldn't, you know, be fast enough or something. But, but uh, and then the next day he, he passed away and I thought, well, I guess that's, that's a nice way to see him technically for the last time before I hear that he's passed away. He was having fun. He was with his favorite fellow critic in the world. And he was on one of the better night shows where you could get noticed. And I was just like, oh, man. Uh, you know. But life's life, c'est la vie. Life goes on, and so will Plagman rules.